Thank you. And thanks a lot for the invitation to be here. So, uh, well, I'm. It's a long time like uh, working in progress project, and uh, so apologize because I know that many people had already hear me giving a similar talk. Yeah, to the talk, but I hope there is something new. Yeah, we keep adding. Thing is that it's a project I'm working now with Marcos Cartin. He's a PhD student, and we are continuing some work that we did some time ago with uh, Jose Ignacio Cogolludo and Ruben Blasco. He was another student here by, by Jose Ignacio and myself. So I'm going to cheat a bit at the beginning and use some stuff what was given in previous talks. Yeah. So basically all this comes from Alex talk. And of course, I'm going to be based also on things that we see, we, we saw in, in Ruth's uh, talk about, because I'm, I'm going to talk about arting. So this is my definition of arting group. I think that's what Alex, uh, Alex definition too. So I take a level graph and I'm I'm not using this Coxeter diagram notation. Yeah, I'm using this graph notation, which is like, uh, allows us to see uh, the presentation of the group. Yeah, so I have a, a graph, I have labels, and I have this kind of relators. And if there is no la label uh, edge between two vertices, there is no relator. So uh, these groups, as we so in, in we heard in, in Ruth's talk, are rather mysterious. Yeah, we, we know really very little about them, but we will know a lot when that conjecture that she was mentioning is finally proved. So basically, I'm going to work with uh, arting groups that satisfy that conjecture. I'm not going to worry about how they look like, but I will assume that they satisfy that conjecture. So this is uh, also Alice's diagram, and I was really uh, th I, I'm thankful to him yeah, for pointing out the relationship yeah, with these polyhedral products. So basically, I'm going to be working either on this side or on the other side. I, I am not going to work in the middle of the diagram. Yeah. So I will basically use the link complex and this Salvetti complex. And uh, maybe I should... If... Uh, if a given arting group satisfies KP1, then the link complex is contractible. So we have this nice space which is contractible on which uh, my group acts. And I know something about stabilizers, and that's going to be important in my talk. And Salvetti. It's a model for KP1. And it means that I can use this uh, space, for example, for computations in homology. So these are the, basically the two things that I'm going to need of these spaces. I want this contractible and this to be a KP1. So uh, just a little reminder of uh, So uh, we also saw in Alex talk that if the Coxeter version, if I have some subgraphs, say, and the Coxeter version of uh, the arting group that I associate to this subgraph is finite, then we say that this arting group is spherical. And a way to construct, or a way to to see that the link complex is using spherical subgroups. Yeah, so if I look at all do those spherical subgroups that I can associate to my, my graph, and here I allow this uh, subgraph to be empty, and in that case, I will have uh, the trivial subgroup. So this is called the spherical pose set. And associated to this uh, pose set, we can extract, which is, a co which is called the pose set pose set. I think also Ruth was mentioning this in the talk, right? So in, if I look at this pose set, 
And I think about the geometric realization in which I points are just elements and simplices are chains. So this is a realization of the, the link uh, complex. And this is the complex really I'm using, this goes set process. Okay, so there is another part of my title that I should explain, and this is, so this would be one art in groups, and now I'm going to say something about sigma invariants. <coughs> so really in this talk, I'm going to work with the sigma invariants as a black box. box. I'm not going really to use the definition. Uh, even I'm not going to give you the actual definition of the invariant. But we don't need it. So, well, I need to talk a bit about uh, finite properties of groups. Yeah. So we know that well, a group is finitely generated. Well, everybody knows what it means. Yeah, but it, topologically, yeah, it this can be interpreted by saying that there is a model for KG one with finite. Right? We can do the same for find presented. Just put in a, a two here, and obviously we can generalize. Yeah, then we have what's called finance condition Fn. <clears throat> that means the same thing, but for n. We can also use these models. I mean, we can go to the universal cover and produce a, a projective resolution for our group. So in a sense, we would be moving yeah, from this kind of homotopic uh, category to the uh, this chain complex yeah. category yeah, that uh, Sarah was talking about. And then we can translate this property into this other category. And we say that a group is, sorry, FPN, even only if there is a projective resolution of the trivial module so that if I only look at two dimension n, everything I see is finitely generated. And obviously, Fn implies Fpn. And now we know that the converse is not true, and we know because of it being a Brady uh, construction, yeah, but also mentioned several times in the conference. Of course, I can do the same thing for F infinity, right? F infinity would mean Fn for everything. So now, being very naive, one could think that one could hope, yeah, that maybe knowing something about G, we could know something about subgroups. And of course, the answer is even if we uh, have a group, satisfy the best possible uh, cosmological finiteness property, which is F infinity, it says nothing yeah, about subgroups. In, in part, that's what's behind yeah, this, all this construction. Yeah, the whole, the whole uh, this is this work. I mean, this was first done for right angle arting groups, and they are F infinity. Yeah, so, but subgroups can behave in, in very different ways. So this is my uh, theory. That's it. To understand homological finiteness properties, not of all subgroups of a given group, but of some. Of two abelian subgroups. By covalent, I mean normal subgroups 
with the abelian quotient. So subject is leaf over the derived circle. I mean, it's not perfect, but it's something. And taking into account that this is a very difficult problem, I, I think that's something good enough, right? To be, for this invariance to be interesting. Okay, so you say, even if I'm, I, I say, I'm not going to give you the definition, but I have to say something yeah, about the invariance. So let me just uh, talk about characters. I'm going to, when I work about arbitrary groups, I'm going to assume my groups are F-infinity. Yeah, just to, I mean, the ambient group, I need it to be nice, yeah, to talk about something. Very, very find it a bit important, sorry, possibly infinite, but it doesn't matter. Well, mainly I'm thinking about uh, infinite, for example. That's not going to be, because the thing is that <clears throat> all these uh, properties are stable under finite index extension. So really, I don't care too much about finite mm, bits. I'm assuming that my groups are F infinity. So in particular, they are finitely generated. Yeah? So this G over the derived subgroup is finitely generated abelian group. So whatever is torsion there is going to be finite. And I don't care too much. Yeah. Your Artin groups are residually finite. I, I don't think it's known. Yeah, for Artin groups, I, I think it's open whether they are residually finite. But I don't need them to be. No, that's not that. Okay, so I'm going to consider a group. And we will say, uh, we call it character to a homomorphism from my group to R. So whenever I have a character, I have a kernel, which is co-abelian. So, and of course, everything, I mean, has to be co-abelian and infinite. I'm going into R. Yeah. I, I will identify two characters if they are a positive scalar multiple one of the other. And using this identification, I, I have an equivalence relationship. And this would be the class. A given character. Yeah? So if you think, uh, when we think about characters, really we can uh, kill the derived subgroup. Yeah? The characters of a group are the same as the character of the abelianization. Yeah? So really we can think uh, about our characters as a sphere, yeah? up, to, up to using this equivalence relationship. Yeah? We can identify the set of equivalent classes of characters with the sphere of rank one, uh, n minus one, where n is a torsion free rank of the organization of my group. And I'm going to give here a little example, which I will use along the talk, yes. So my example is going to be an art. <coughs> I'm going to consider just the art group generated by these three vertices. And the labels will be four, three, and two. Uh, this is what's called B3 in Coxeter notation, say. But this B is not the B for braid. So this is not the braid group. Yeah, it's the other one. Braid group, braid groups are A's in this notation, which I find very confusing. But anyway, so is life. Yeah. So here, if you think, well, I, I can't write explicitly my relations here, right? So if we, if we want to define a character here, really, well, this is going to, this relation dies in the abelianization, the same thing for this one, yeah? But this one is not dying, yeah? So every character you want to figure out will have the same image, yeah? For, for U and W, yeah? Because of this relator. 
Yeah, so we don't have any choice here. Yeah. In fact, here the abelianization is so this is going to be G. Abelianization has rank two. So my sphere is just S1. And to give you a character, I only have to give you a, a pair of real numbers. Yeah, because I only have to give you the image of V and U. This determines my character. So V and U. So, going back here, and I will try to keep that black box. That's adding things. So now I want to tell you a bit about the uh, stigma variants. So the first stigma <coughs> was, I mean, originally B, uh, this theory was created by B.D. Strebel and then was Neumann and Renz were also adding stuff yeah, to the to the theory. So they were, BD and Stevel were originally motivated for metabelian groups, yeah, and then created this invariant to understand metabelian groups, which are difficult enough. Yeah. So the way they define this first invariant is very different yeah, to the definition I'm going to give you, but this is how we define it today. So they, we can define the sigma invariant as the set of characters which do the following. I mean, equivalent classes. Yeah. You take a group and you, then you draw the Cayley graph. And here you just forget about elements in the group for which the character is negative. You stay, you take just the positive, uh, non negative part. Yeah? So if what you see is connected, then the character is here. This is just the definition. I'm going to give just very just two very easy examples. So assume you have a free group, group of rank two, then your Cayley graph is the usual tree. And what happens with trees is that they are, it's very easy yeah, to disconnect a tree. It's too easy. Yeah? Whatever you remove, it's going to be disconnected. Yeah? So in here, sigma, it's empty, there's nothing. So we have the opposite situation. You will have a Fourier abelian group of rank two, yeah? because then Kelly is, is, the, is the grid. And if you think about removing things with whatever value here, it's the same as drawing a line yeah? and taking one of the sides of the line. Yeah? And of course, this is going to be connected. So it means that in this case, sigma invariant is everything. Could you explain that a bit more? I'm kind of a bit confused. Yes. Um, so what's, I'm not sure what she's getting to. Um, <laughs> okay, we can, we can talk later. Yeah. So. The main property, well, I told you, yeah, that these invariants tell us yeah, how to understand homological properties of subgroups, but obviously I don't expect anybody to see that from the definition. Yeah, so well, I don't see that from the definition. Yeah, maybe you do. I don't. Yeah. So the main property that uh, allows us to do that is the following theorem. Oh, the theorem, yes? You mean that sigma g for z square is S1 then? Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah, of course. It's everything. Yeah, yeah. It's S1. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. It's the character. Yeah. N squared is the group. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Sorry. Sigma, yeah, maybe that was... The sigma one is built out of the characters, not the yeah. group. Right, right, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sigma, my... always sigma, any sigma I'm going to, to use lives here, right? Right. Yeah. So I'm sorry because I'm, I think, I'm not being. 
or I am giving you the definition of sigma one. Then really uh, Strebel Neumann. Let's Strebel. Define a whole family, not just the sigma one I gave you. Yeah, they, they define a whole family of invariants. <clears throat> and they uh, they come into pairs as many things in, in this area. One is the homotopical version and the other is the homological version. All of them are inside this sphere. Yeah, all of them live inside this sphere. And the property that makes them interesting is this theorem that I was going to write, but maybe I can just this lack of here. And it's the following result. And it was like a theorem that took like uh, 10 years, yeah, to prove all together by, by the same authors, Mitz, Trevor, Neumann. <laughs> so, but they tell us that if I take a group, as I was saying, like the best possible, uh, properties and you take a coabelian subgroup then your group is fn if and only if the following happens whenever you have a character that kills n that character has to be class in sigma n. This is the way we can see, yeah? we can understand cohomological properties of coabelian subgroups if we knew this invariant. Just checking. We have the similar, a similar, I'm going to just put the, at this point, maybe the homotopical, same thing for homological, right? Put set or but I don't know why I put R. Really, I'm going to work about set. So this, for example, allows us to understand what happens with the derived sub. We can determine now when the derived subgroup. The derived subgroup is going to be. Uh, Fn, if and only if the whole uh, sphere is the invariant for n, things like that. There is a particular case in which this characterization is a bit easier, and it's the case when my character has, I mean, the image of my character has rank one. Yeah, I can, in that case, I can move my character to something ending in set. Yeah, in this case, the kernel. It's not only coabelian, it's co-cyclic. Yeah, the Gaussian is going to be cyclic. And if you think there are only two invariants that vanish in my co in my in my kern, in my n, this character itself and the opposite. Yeah, because that's not in the same equivalent class, because I, I ask this t to be positive. Yeah. So this tells us that in this case, and it's whatever, if and only if my character minus my character <laughs> lives there, which is a bit easier to check than the other condition. Yeah? Because I'm going to be interested in arcing groups 
let me just tell you that in the case of an arting group, using the symmetry of the presentation, it's not difficult to see that any of these invariant is invariant under the antipodal map. And this means that really here, we only have to worry about one of them. So the R team, we have this property. Yes. One time. It's a bit easy. Can I ask a, just an intuition question? Because I've, I've never seen these definitions before. Uh, maybe you said this and I missed it. So sigma one is kind of about connectivity. So mm -hmm. then are the higher sigma ends about sort of and homotopy groups and then the yeah, it's, it's, yeah, well, I, I could give you the definition. Yeah, no, but it's intuitively. The thing, yeah, intuitively, yes, it's only that there are some technical problems that make the definition of uh, sigma n, the homotopical version, a bit nasty yeah, to, to give. But it's based on connectivity, higher connectivity mm -hmm. yeah, of, of, uh, of models mm -hmm. yeah, for KP1, as you can imagine. The, 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 the definition of, of the Homological version is much easier, and I can give you that one. So sigma one, I gave you the uh, homotopical version of the definition, but the um, uh, more like homological one uh, would be this. This is a set of invariants uh, for which if you form this monoid, I, Instead of looking at the Cayley graph and killing whatever makes the character uh, negative, yeah, I consider the monoid yeah, that this element generate. And if this is of type FP1, then my character is here. Yeah? I, I'm not making the distinction between homological and homotopical here because they are the same for sigma one, just for sigma one. Yeah. From here, they are different. Uh, well, if you work with uh, homology of groups, this is familiar. Yeah. <laughs> then sigma n, homological version, is the same thing. Here you see immediately how to generalize. Yeah, It's fpn here, and that's it. The homotopical is a bit more complicated. But we also have this property. If you understand the homological, and you understand sigma two, you understand homotopical. And this is also familiar yeah, for people working in this area. Yeah, so really understanding the homological plus this is enough. Right? Understand everything. That was yeah, that's great. Thank okay. you. Okay. Can I ask what, what is the monoid? I didn't understand. Sorry? Z G at Chi. I didn't get yeah. what the definition is. Yeah. <laughs> So this is the set of elements in my group for which my character is not negative. And this is not a group anymore yeah, because, uh, but it's a monoid, you can multiply here. Yeah, and then if you do homological algebra over this monoid and you... That definition is clearly independent of the presentation, but is it supposed to be obvious that... It's not obvious. No. Yeah, 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 all right. There's something to do. Yeah, yeah. And it's not obvious either, at least to me, yeah, that these two definitions are the same, but they are. Uh, one can prove that. Okay, so I think I was here. And yeah, because I've not, yeah, I, I gave you a bit of the definition I was, but I was not wanting to do that. So you can imagine that I'm not going to, well, I told you, yeah, I'm not going to need a definition, but I should use something. Yeah, so and now, I would like to give you a couple of results yeah, that are the results that we, really, we are really using yeah, to understand our environments. Usually, it's very, very difficult to compute that. And it's, well, it makes sense yeah, because it, they give us a lot of information. Yeah? So to have so much information, we have to pay yeah, a price. And the price is that it's difficult. Yeah, to, but sometimes there are like nice results that one can use. One of them is the following theorem. This was proved by Maya, minor, one big. 
and they prove that if you have a group of infinity and you have a character and you are lucky enough to have a center in the group and even luckier yeah to know that your character is not does not vanish in the center then sigma belongs to everything to all this possible invariant sigma infinity is sigma n for every n yeah i didn't say that but these invariants are sitting each in the next one so but i mean the other way around so uh, if of them is more demanding yeah so sigma infinity is the intersection of all sigma n every time yeah? And also, well, from here you see, yeah, the, the homotopical is always inside the homology. So I find this result really surprising. Yeah, it's well, it's not always so lucky. Yeah, but if you are, then you know. Yeah, this invariant. And let me go back here to this example because this is. One of the cases in which we have a center and we know. So in this case, the center of this, well, this is a spherical arting group. I, I don't know if I say that. Yeah? This is spherical and the, and the center of spherical arting groups are, is known. Yeah? And you can just see yeah, what it is. Always depends on, I mean, it's related to, to length of words in the Coxeter group that you associate with. So you have to pick the longest uh, word in that Coxeter group, and then some power of that longest word is going to generate the center. Basically, that's the. So in this case, uh, this is something like this, and I think this is a three. But uh, well, let's put something. Yeah, just think. Always two. It's always two, or it doesn't not depend on something. Well. Really, I don't care about the power. One or two. One or two. Okay. Yeah. One or two. Okay. Yes. Okay. Let's is. Let's say it's a two. It doesn't matter because really, for my character, I don't care about how many times do I have that here. So here, what I see is that uh, because I know that my character uh, has the same value in U and W, so the value of my character. And whatever power yeah, is going to be determined by this, right? So it means that if this is not zero, yeah, my character is going to be in the sphere, in the in the invariant. Yeah. So this tells us that all characters. Except of possibly. So for this to be zero, I have to take this minus two and this one and the opposite. These are the only two characters for which I don't know yeah, at this point. And so we. Reduce the problem yeah, very much as using, using that result. So there is another result. It's a bit more technical, but also probably will be familiar for people working in the area by the same authors. They prove the following. Assume you have a character and you have a space. Yeah, here we finally see some space. Yeah, you have a space in which the group acts nicely. Yeah, so I want, I'm going to assume uh, that uh, this has finite and skeleton. Okay, skeleton. No, and I think. And, and I'm going to assume that X is N minus one connected. 
Now, if I know that when I look at my character and restrict to stabilizers, things behave. So I know that whenever I have a cell, I'm going to assume that this is CW complex. <laughs> and for cells of size P, not bigger than N, I'm going to assume I have this, and this is the stabilizer. And, well, just here, implicitly, I am assuming that my character is not zero in stabilizer. Yeah, but this is implicit here, but it's important yeah, to have it into account. Yeah, so I, I write. So I know if I know all this, then my character belongs to sigma n. So I'm going to go back to my example. I have this character, which is mysterious. I only have to understand one of them because they behave the same. One is the opposite of the other. Yeah? So the problem is reduced to one particular character, this character. Yeah? So which complex which I could I use to try to apply uh, this? We allow stabilizer, yeah? So I, I'm not, I don't need a free action. It means that I don't have to go to this, to, for example, for in the arching case, to the universal cover of Salvetti. I, I could think about the link complex. Yeah. If X is, uh, I'm going to put Y, but, yeah? If Y is the link <laughs> complex, stabilizers in the link complex are these subgroups that I use, yeah? This is the coset poset associated to, uh, which are called parabolic subgroups, subgroups associated to subgraphs, and these are the stabilizer. Well, those and conjugated of those, yeah? So stabilizers are conjugated to what? To Well, notation is not nice here because this looks like a triangle. This is not a triangle. This is the triangle. Yeah, this is a subgroup, a subgraph. I'm sorry, I didn't realize. Okay, now, uh, what is nice and what is not nice? So if you think about my, my value characters, use this one, for example. Maybe I use a different color. So my character is minus one here, one here, and one here, right? So if you... See what happens when I re uh, reduce. I mean, I consider my character <laughs> this uh, edge. It's not vanishing in the center. So we know that it belongs to the best possible invariant. Everything is nice. Same thing for, for the other edges. Same thing for the vertices. So my character is behaving very nicely in all these subgraphs. But there are two subgraphs which I don't like, which are the trivial one, yeah. So all behave nice, except oh, the case of empty graph in which I have the trivial, and of course everything vanishes in the trivial group, right? So that's bad. And the whole graph, because of course this is precisely vanishing in the center of the whole thing. Yeah? So these two are not nice to me. Yeah? So I'm calling this the link complex, but some people call this a modified the link complex. Yeah? Because it's, uh, originally when Delane defined his complex, he didn't call it the link complex. He, I don't, I don't he, he gave a name, yeah? But originally what he was doing, he was working just with spherical groups and he just removed the biggest uh, possible cell. That was the original definition. Yeah. 
And he proved that that complex is uh, S minus two connected, yeah, where S is the number of, of vertices. And this is nice. It's only that I, that's not enough for me. I have to remove one more, more cell. But still, yeah, using what he did or working, I mean, in this example, it's not difficult to see that if I remove them, I get another complex, which I'm, call X, I'm going to call X, in which I don't have this bad cell. So I don't have this bad stabilizer. Everything is nice. And this, uh, let me think. This is connected. Uh, so the link complex is um, three minus two is one connected. If you remove that, one can prove that this is connected, at, at least connected. So it means that we can apply our theorem for some n. And what we deduce? Yeah. Is that the same as removing all of the A empty set cosets? And Sorry? Is the same as removing all of the A empty set cosets from the original coset? Yes. yes. And, and yeah. What I do basically is I consider the poset that I get when I remove the part. Yeah. Okay. Sets, yeah. And then I form the coset poset. Mm -hmm. This is going to be Y. No, this is going to be X. Oh. Yeah. It's yeah. always. Yeah. I mean, if you reduce the connectivity, but you, you I mean, you pay the price of reducing connectivity, but you are happy because you get nice stabilizer. Basically, that's the idea. Yeah. One can. Okay. I thought X was always a homotopy type of a word of spheres, but this is. Uh, y. It's Y. It's the homotopy type. It's the real domain. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Because I, I need to remove something else. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So it's. It's a different complex. Yeah, it's just, see. So yeah. Yeah. X is like you're removing the interior of the right. Of the, okay. it's a two, in this case, it's a two dimensional simplicial complex, and you remove the interior of the yeah. triangles. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. okay. Yeah. Also, removing the edges. Okay. So, I'm running out of time, but the thing is that I'm spending, I was playing with this example because basically this is a baby example. Yeah. But many of the things that I'm doing here is what we do in the proof of the theorem. Yeah. And then I think it's easier yeah, to see it here. So now, I mean, at this point, we know what happens here, right? Sigma one is everything. But still, we don't know what happens from sigma two, right? What can we do? What we can do now? Is you salvetti. I didn't use salvetti so far. Yeah. What can we use salvetti for? So if now I consider uh, I, I don't remember now, but it was something with an S yeah, in your notation. So this is going to be you the universal cover of salvetti. No, better I'm going to consider Salvet. So associated to my character, it is now uh, that character, minus two or one, I think. Yeah. We can form a cyclic cover. And if I homologate, uh, if I uh, this cyclic cover, I'm going to denote by I don't know T. Yeah. So the homology of T tells me the homology of the kernel <coughs> of the character, and I can compute that because for Salvetti we have a lot of information. Yeah, for computation, we, there are description yeah, of really how differentials are and everything, so one can compute. Yeah. What do I get out of these computations? In this, in this case, one can prove that this
working in a field of uh, characteristic two. Let's make things a bit easier. Uh, one can prove that this is infinite dimensional. And then that tells me that this group cannot be infinitely presented. So my character is not in sigma two, right? My character is here, not in sigma two. And that's all I needed to know. Yeah, because it's not in sigma two, it's not going to be in any other sigma. So from this, I, I deduce everything. At this point, I can understand completely. Yeah. And now, with uh, sorry, no time, <laughs> maybe I, I try to give you uh, an idea of uh, the genial theorem that we, we proved. I really should start with what's uh, Maya. I mean, Minor and big uh, I mean they they proved those uh, theorem th those results I mentioned because they wanted to compute sigma invariance for right angular t groups, right? Um the result is the following. So I've got here a gamma is sorak. And assume you have character. Well, all the time I'm going to assume. I have a character. So they prove that I'm going to write here the, the condition one gets. And I'm going to just work with the, the homology, uh, homotopical version. Yeah. So, but they prove that if Whenever you have a cell, in the flag complex associated to gamma, and this is the flag construction. Okay. If you look at the link, oh, let me, because I'm going to say something to it and well, Sorry, I'm going to use the notation I have here. It's, I mean, I could co continue as it was, but it's better if I, if I just copy, because otherwise I'm going to say something stupid. Assume that forever, for every complete subgraph, two graph, that's really the same as I was writing, but I need here my character to be zero. And I assume that my, the size of this, thing is not too big. I look at the link in this, and this is the living subgraph. This is gamma when I remove vertices for which my character dies. And this is n minus one minus the size of the cell connected. But this is equivalent, my character limit. This is the result. But if you think this generalizes uh, Spino Brady, Spino Brady is this result for a particular character. It's the character that sends everything to one. So for, for in the Spino Brady situation, here really we only have the empty uh, subgraph. This is the only condition that one has to check. And if you plug that here, you will get precisely yeah, the, the condition in between a brief theory. Yeah? There is also a case which I like, and it's the case of sigma one. And if you think, I don't have time, so I'm just going through details. But for sigma one, this mm -hmm. tells us that a character belongs to sigma one, if and only if this thing is connected and dominant. And I wanted to say this as we hear this dominance in graphs yesterday. So 
cells are here. Yeah, this is because here. Yeah, that tells us when something is in, in sigma. Okay, <coughs> this is for Rax. I want to say something about Artin. The same authors they they did some work on Artin groups, and they did prove uh, something really not generalizing this, but related to this. But I, I probably skipped that. Yes. Uh, not so. Delta. <laughs> When your character vanishes on delta, so it's not in i uh, gamma i. So what's no no no. So here the idea is that these are the bad guys. Let me maybe I write that because that really is what one needs to understand this and, and generalization too. So these are the bad guys. Yeah, in which my character behaves bad. And these are the good guys. Yes, but for, yeah? to, to take the link, don't we need delta to be contained in gamma chi? Okay, no, yeah. I know what you mean, sorry. So I, I look at my graph. This somewhere is the good guys, and delta is somewhere here. Yeah, But I look at those vertices here connected to delta. So if you if you like, I should write this. It's the intersection the of the big link with the good guys. I, I should write it like this. It's only that notation is long enough. And that's why I, I yeah, <laughs> this is what I mean. Really, this is what I mean. That's the dominant that's condition the you're talking about. Sorry? That's the dominant condition you're talking about, that the, the it, gamma it, X is it, connected it, to the- It's the related to the dominant connect condition, right? Because I, I want the link to be not non-empty. Yeah, and this is the dominate condition, right? Yeah. Yeah. So this is how we should understand that. Yeah. So these are the bad guys, and this is the link in the good guys. So that's has to be connected, you know, yeah, for my condition to hold. Yeah, basically. So. Later, we, I mean, I, I mentioned that this is very same thing that we also did with uh, previously, some time ago, with, <clears throat> with Ruben and, and Jose Ignacio. And what we did, maybe I have more names here. Blas, Kroch, Isitacio, Cogolludo, Escartin, myself. So, we first generalize this to our team, which are even and have type FC. Even is that all labels are even. FC is that everything which is complete is spherical. Yeah? So we did generalize this condition. But here, instead of asking this, the bad guys, so it's going to look the same, but Now I have to take into account the center, not the cell itself. Yeah, because moving to Artin, yeah, this is becomes important. And here I have the same situations. Everything is the same. Well, not everything is the same. I only have one uh, That's a problem. And here I have links in something smaller. What do I have to, to do? I have to remove some vertices and edges. Even edges for which well, this is technical. Yeah, I have to remove more things. This is basically what I wanted to say, but we have this condition. So what we did now, well, I choose that example, which is not even. Yeah, and the reason is what we wanted to see what happens for not even. We realized that really, we only need our group to satisfy the KP1 conjecture. Yeah, that's enough. You know, we don't need the group to be FC type or anything. Yeah? So we are working with arting groups to satisfy the 
everyone. And we get the same condition here, also with the center. And now here we have to consider links in a graph, in a complex that we associate to my uh, character and to my subset. But the idea is the same. The idea is that I form this, yeah, removing but guys. For example, if I see inside my complex a cell like this one, and my character in that cell behaves that like this one, what I do is to remove the interior of the cell. I leave all the others. So moreover, because we wanted to work like in a more general situation, we don't think about just the link, but kind of spherical link. I only need to look at cells so that when I, uh, the union of that cell with my uh, delta is spherical. Yeah, so it's a bit technical. That's that's why I don't think it's worth to write here the, the definition. But I just want to say is that it's the same idea. Yeah, remove, look at the good guys, look at the complex, see which are the good guys. Yeah, uh, there. And use this link, or if you want, spherical list. Yeah? And then the connectivity of this also gives the same result. And now, well, I'm sorry because I'm taking too much time, but I just want to say I'm not going to write anything else. Yeah, but of course, one would like to have the converse. Yeah, the converse is really tricky. Yeah, it's much more difficult than one expects. Even for sigma one, I mean, some of these uh, results, uh, in, uh, everything is much easier in sigma one. Yeah, so this was known in the case of sigma one. Uh, this was known in sigma one, but the, to reverse this for sigma one is an open problem, difficult problem. Yeah? What one can do, at least in some case, is cohomological computations, as we did there. Yeah? So sometimes one can use Salvetti complex and compute uh, homology to deduce the converse. But Things get much more complicated uh, if you work with arbitrary arting groups. I mean, we we had that we have done, done that before in the even case in which things are easier. In the general case, this is much more complicated. And what we have done so far, we have a spectral sequence that helps us to compute uh, cohomology in some cases. But yeah, so really, in which cases we can reverse this? Basically, we compute we are computing homology in prime characteristic. So we need a prime yeah, that is behaving well. Basically what we need is that there is a prime that divides uh, the labels of the even edges. Instead of, I mean, there could be edges with label two, we don't care about them, but for the others, yeah, our prime has to divide. Yeah, basically that's it. Um, I stopped, I'm sorry. 